repeat it again. Hallelujah. Woo. I've been receiving, taking so many notes in this conference. Today I get to the great privilege of closing out this conference. Of so many voices have spoken prophetically into our lives. And I want to speak prophetically for the next few minutes into you. Are you ready? Ready or not? Here it comes. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Transform. We're talking about the transformed life. The transformed nature. How many want to be fruitful in your life? You want your life to mean something. Listen, we can have an experience or we can have a transformation. A lot of people have experiences in God, but they're not transformed by God. And I don't know about you, but I want more than an experience. You can only be fruitful according to the understanding of what is inside of you. That's what you're going to be working from for your entire life. What is inside of you. As a church, we can only be fruitful according to the understanding of our potential, of our nature on the inside of us. As a church, we see that built into our local body. And we're just kind of packed in here today. We're almost getting to a place we can't even do a full service together. But isn't it great when we get to do that once in a while? God's called us to do certain things. And I want you to know today that transforming begins at the core. I want everybody to say core. It begins at the core, on the inside. The more you understand what is inside of you, the more you understand what you're created to be, the more you will be able to become what God has created you to become. But if you don't understand what's inside of you, you can't become what's inside of you. You have to be transformed on the inside before you can get change on the outside. The problem with people is we tend to look from the outside in rather than from the inside out. But God always works from the inside out. He always sees from the inside out. Romans chapter 12, and I want you to just look at verse 2. I just want to isolate this one verse today. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, and it simply says this. Do not be conformed... To this world say conformed but be transformed by the what the renewing of your mind where does transformation happen in your mind where does transformation begin in your mind when God wants to change something in you where is he going to start in your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me say something to you today. You will either conform or you will transform. There's no in between. You will either conform or you will transform. It will always be one or the other. And if you think of your mind as a steering wheel that can change the direction of your destiny and your life, then you transform by the way you turn your mind. You transform when you align your mind and put it in the direction that God is calling you to go. That's when transformation happens. If you still have your Bible open, put your hand right on that verse in your Bible. Holy Spirit, I thank you today that you're going to make the word come alive inside of us. Your word is powerful. It's quick. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides us, God. It, it divides us within us, God. Separating what is not like you to what is like you. Your word is truth. Truth transforms us, God. And I thank you today that the transforming power of your word in the next few minutes is going to go and change each and every person in this room today. In the name of Jesus, amen. It's no coincidence that you came into this world head first. Listen, if you want to break a habit, if you want to change something in your life, if you want to stop smoking, stop drinking, you're going to have to do it head first. 
You have to do it in your head before you can do it in your body. I want everybody to say head first. If you decide, I'm not going to be promiscuous, I'm not going to watch pornography anymore, I'm not going to live in a, more, in a moral lifestyle, the change has to start in your mind, not in your activity. Say head first. If you decide I'm going to improve my life, I'm going to continue my education, I'm going to change my career, it has to begin in your mind before you can succeed in your direction. The transformation has to happen head first. It has to start in your thinking. God has to get a hold of you in your thinking before he can get a hold of you in your life. And a lot of people are struggling in their life, frustrated, praying, turning in circles, quoting scripture, doing everything they know to do and they're not changing because they haven't changed in their mind they haven't changed in their thinking if you decide I'm getting out of debt it has to hit your head before it hits your wallet if you decide I'm going to lose weight I have to get skinny in my head before I get skinny in my body come on look at somebody next to you say I've got skinny thinking hallelujah Come on, for me, it may not have hit my body yet, but in my head, I'm a very trim, fit, healthy, and good-looking dude. I just want you to know. If it doesn't start in your head, it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside. If it doesn't start in your head, it doesn't matter what's happening in your body. You can lose weight in your body and still have an image in your head that is overweight. They, there's a name for that. It's called anorexia and people die from it. They don't die from what's happening in their body. They die because of a stronghold in their mind. That same stronghold in the mind is killing some of you in different areas. In food, we call it eating disorders. Anorexia, bulimia. I tell people I'm half bulimic. I binge, I just don't purge. Amen. So pray for me. I'm half delivered. Listen. Sorry, I got out of the spirit. Let me get back in. <laughs> you have all kinds of things going on in your head and the devil will kill you by what's in your thinking. He will cause you to fall because you always follow your head. You always follow what's in your thinking. If your thinking has not shifted, your life cannot shift. If your thinking is not transformed, your life cannot transform. So when transformation happens, the Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 12 that transformation begins by the renewing of your mind. So bring, those, uh, bring that table over here to me. I brought these these to use as a metaphor. I have some wonderful and dear friends who have come down for this conference from New York and I want all of you to stand up. They are past, they, they lead in, in, in pastor in Celebration Church in central New York. And I love these guys right here. I love these guys so much. And I love you. Mwah. And I especially love you because every time they come, they bring me apples. And there's no apple like a New York apple. Right? Like a New York City, the big apple. I brought some of the apples. These are, this is one of the New York apples right here. There's some different kind of apples I'm not sharing. Listen, they're wonderful. But I brought these apples today as a metaphor because there are all different kinds of apples. There are different there are different shapes of apples. There are different colors of apples, right? There are different types. They have different names. But in their nature, they're still the same. They're still classified as an apple. The only way you can change the nature of what this apple is, is not to change what's on the outside, but to change what's in the core. And I want to talk to you about this for just a moment because the goal is to take what is inside of the apple and to use it to transform it. The design of the apple was to take what's in its core and to use it to transform into a tree so there could be more apples. You see, there is no reproductive life 
in the peeling of the apple. There's no reproductive life there, right? There's no reproductive life in the flesh of the apple. The reproductive life is only in the seed, which is in the core. All the rest of the apple exists to take care of, to feed, to nurture, and to protect the seed. Because the reproductive quality is in the seed. How many already see where I'm going with this illustration? Guess where your quality of value and reproduction is? In your seed, in your core. It's on the inside. It's not what's on the outside. And, and so that's true of us. You, you can change your clothes. You can change your hair. You can change your name. You can change your title. You can change everything about you and all around you. But if you don't change the core, you really haven't changed. You're just a different version of the same thing. Right? Because you can't... Listen, no matter how much you like tomatoes, no matter how much you eat tomatoes... You can't take an apple and transform it into a tomato. You can't. When you get to the seed, all you can do with the seed is take it and turn it into a higher expression or a different expression of itself. Now listen, because this is speaking right to some of you today. When we're talking about transforming, you can't transform into something different than you are. You can dress it up. You can change it. You can put lipstick in a dress on a pig. It's still a pig. The nature of what something is is still the nature of what something is. And the only thing you can do is you can take your nature and transform it into a higher purpose or a higher version of what it's originally created to be. You can take an apple and you can turn it into an apple tree. It can become an apple blossom. It can become a different variety of apple, but it can't turn into a banana. You hear what I'm saying to you? So there are some things you might be trying to do that are not central to who you are created to be. And if you don't focus on your core and get a revelation of your identity and who God has designed you to be and called you to be, you will end up becoming something adverse and opposed to what you were created to be. You'll be frustrated and miserable and you'll make everybody around you frustrated and miserable. So God tells us that he calls us to transform from the core by the renewing of our mind. And then he tells us why he calls us to transform. So that we may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. What that means is God wants you to prove what he had in mind when he created you. When God transforms you, he transforms you to prove something about himself. He transforms you so you can become something that he created that ultimately reveals more about who he is. God wants you to shine at what he created you to be. He wants you to be proof of his perfect nature. He wants you to be proof of his goodness. He wants you to be proof that you are acceptable in his sight. He wants your life, but you can't do it if you're not transformed because in your mind, the devil will lie to you and convince you that you're something other than what you are or you are a lower level than what God created and designed you to be. So if you will allow God to transform you in your thinking and in your mind, if you will allow him to transform your life, then you will become the perfect and good and acceptable thing that he called you to be. And you, you're proof of that. You're proof of that. When we think about God's will for our lives, we often only think about it in spiritual terms. But it has the full gamut. God's perfect will for you is holistic. It doesn't just apply to you spiritually. It also applies to you personally. It also applies to you professionally. You need to understand God's perfect will, his perfect design for you in every dimension. Why? Because when you go to seek out a career or a job, you need to know who you're designed to be so you don't get yourself tied into something that you were never designed to be tied into. The same thing applies in your relationships. People approach relationships without considering their God-given design. Some only look at relationships physically. 
Some look at relationships spiritually. Well, God told me, Shababa, you're my wife. Some people, come on, it's happened. Some people look at emotionally. Well, we don't have the chemistry. Listen, if you don't fully consider God's design to begin with, you're going to spend the next 10, 20 years, years of your life married to somebody that you're trying to change the whole time. And the problem isn't them. The problem is you never knew who you were. So you end up intertwining yourself with something God didn't lead you to because you didn't know who you were. So you end up messed up in a relationship and you mess up somebody else's life. Listen, transformation is important. You have to know the nature of who you are. You have to know who God called you to be so that you can be in the right fit with the right relation. There's no perfect things. There's going to be issues and problems. But when you are connected in the right way, you grow in that. Right? You grow in it. It, it. it builds something in you. So you need to understand who you are so that you put your efforts into what is central to your nature. Then the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is revealed in you. That's how it works. The problem with people is you're so busy trying to know everybody else, you haven't known yourself. Instead of seeking God and his word and discovering who you are and letting him transform your mind, you spend all your time on Facebook trying to look at everybody else's business. And we get so focused on everybody else. The reason you have so many problems in your relationships with other people is because you don't have a healthy relationship with you. Because you don't know who you are. Because of that, you won't know what to draw toward. And you won't know what you need. And when you don't know what you need, you end up picking people by their peelings. Hmm, I like this one better. This one's good. We end up picking people by their peelings. Because that's what we see. Come on, you're not hearing me this morning yet. Because if you pick people by their peelings and you never get down to the core, you don't know what's under the surface. You don't recognize what's in the core because you don't know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, you don't know who to pick. You don't know where to work. You don't know what business to go in. And you end up going to, into business chasing money when you should be chasing purpose. Because when you find your purpose, you're going to find your prosperity is connected to your purpose. You might have spent the first few years of your life in peeling positions. With peeling people, peeling jobs, peeling ministries, peeling relationships. Why? Because peelings are appealing. Pun intended. Come on, look at somebody next to you. Say, peelings are appealing. Just because it is appealing on the outside, aesthetically or monetarily, does not mean it is designed for you. And you could end up making more money and be miserable in your money. Some people think, well, I'd like to try that kind of misery. But listen... God has called you to be identified with a purpose that he put inside of you before you were ever in your mother's womb. In fact, he told before the world was even created, he already saw you here today with the seed that he placed in you to be. So guess what the devil's always trying to do? He's always trying to mess you up at your core. He's always trying to get you focused on the outside instead of on the inside. And if we can't transform on the inside, if we can't understand in our mind what God is trying to do, we end up our whole life spinning in circles, chasing things we were never meant to connect to. It's going to be in the realm of your true nature to perform what is expected of you when you are functioning central to your design. So there's a lot of talk today about sexual identity confusion, but let me tell you something, there's also something known as spiritual identity confusion. And you end up as a spiritual cross-dresser, trying to be somebody you were never called to be, trying to look like somebody God never designed you to look like. 
In business terminology, it's called a brand. A brand is a promise to the consumer what to expect when they go into a facility. That's why when you go to KFC, their theme line is, we do chicken right. That means if you're looking for a hamburger, you're in the wrong place. Because they don't do hamburgers right, they do chicken right. That's what they say. And I don't know how you think about KFC, but that's what they say. And their focus is chicken. They're clear about what they do. The problem is, instead of being led by our internal instinct, instead of allowing God to transform us and being led by the Spirit, we end up led by our urges. Let me talk to you about this for a minute. Are we okay so far? You getting a hold of this? God has placed an instinct inside of you directly tied to your transformed identity. There is something that will pull you after the nature that he's called you to be. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells a parable that is one of the most famous parables in the Bible. We have nicknamed the parable the prodigal son. Have you ever heard the story of the prodigal son? I want you to look at this in Luke chapter 15 and let me read you a few verses of this parable. Let's look at verse 11. Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them to, to so he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. If you look at the King James, it says he spent all that he had on riotous living. But when he had spent all, say the words, spent all. There arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now this is really important because you understand Jesus is telling this parable. Jesus is Jewish. He's telling it to Jewish people. And guess what the most unclean animal is to a Jewish person? Pigs. So what happens is he ends up connected to something that God never designed him to be connected to. Hmm. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, I want to stop there, and I want to read, go back to look at verse 17. I want to pull this verse out of the New Living Translation for just a moment, because I love the phrase that it says there. It says, when he finally came to his senses. When he, if you underline things in your Bible, you underline the words when he finally came to himself or when he finally came to his senses. It was an urge that made the prodigal son leave home. It was an urge that caused him to crave the control of his own life. It was an urge that caused him to want recognition. We all have urges. But the urges led the son out out of the father's house out of God's will out of his purpose away from his core values away from his brand urges will always force you to serve them and serve them and serve them until they kill you urges always end up depleting you 
Urges will always rob you. Because urges are temporary impulses that cause you to make permanent changes. Impulse changes will often disrupt the most valuable things in your life. So where will the enemy hit you? He's going to put urges into your thinking. And when he puts urges into your thinking, he causes your thinking to become conformed. And when your thinking becomes conformed, your life becomes deformed. And so the only way to fix it is to be transformed. And you're only transformed in your thinking. The same place that you were conformed. The same place that the urges come. So here's the son all the way down to the hog pen. This boy continues to follow his urges. There are people in this room. You have been spiraling down, down, down. And you've been praying all the way down. And you can't figure out why you're still spiraling down. You're praying right, but you're being led by your urges. Not by your purpose. You sowed a seed in the offering. But then you went to work and flipped out on your boss. And your urge to get the last word or prove that you're right destroyed your opportunity for promotion. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? It's not that you didn't tithe right. It's not that you're not praying right. It's not even that you don't love Jesus. It's that you're still allowing urges to be your master instead of the Jesus that you're praying to for deliverance. You have to be transformed in your mind so you can be changed into who God called you to be. And then doors will begin to swing open and swing open and swing open in your life. Listen to what I'm telling you. Because you can be praying one thing with your mouth and being led by something else in your life and trying to figure out why your prayer is not working. Prayer isn't working because your urges are driving the car. And by an urge, this prodigal son demanded his inheritance. The father divides up his portion, and the Bible says he immediately began to spend it on riotous living. Spend, spend, spend. Urges always make you spend. You will spend more and gain less in your life because urges are always making withdrawals, and purpose isn't making any deposits. You see, urges always withdraw, purpose always deposits. And he finally ended up bankrupt eating in the hog pen. And if you don't have the courage to assess your own situation today and see where you are in terms of depletion, you might end up in the hog pen with the pigs wondering how you got there. If you've gone from the father's house, listen, you will always end up in fellowship with hogs in the hog pen. Because God's design for you is to be in his house. I see this happen over and over. You need to look and see the people that are around you because those around you may be a picture of you. Some of you look uncomfortable. Listen, this is so important because I, I can tell a lot about you if I just look at your cell phone. Between your cell phone and your credit card, I don't even have to meet you to know you. Because where you spend your time, how you spend your money, and who you talk to will always reveal what's important to you and where your priorities are. When you handle your priorities and your decisions in alignment with your urges instead of in alignment with your purpose, you will be stuck right back in the same place again. But when the lost son had come to his end, when he was without any option, there was something deep inside of him that pulled him back to the father's house. This is very important because something in him was still calling him to transform when he was a mess and without options. Let me tell you, there is a hope for my life. There's a hope for your life even when we mess it up. Even when we make wrong decisions. Even when I get in the flesh. There's something that God has pre-deposited in my life that draws me back to him. It, it pulls me back. Hmm. You see, when, when the son was in the pig pen, something began to change. When 
all of his resources had ended when he comes to, sometimes it's in the mercy of God to let you lose everything because then you don't have anywhere else to look but to him and you start thinking back about the father's house he still had the same surroundings Nothing had changed in the natural. He was still separated from his father. He was still in the same clothes. He was still eating pig food with flies flying around his head. Nothing in his geography changed. Nothing in his circumstances changed to get him back on course. All he had to do to be freed from his situation, all he had to do to transition was to change his mind. When he came to his senses it tied into something that God had pre-deposited what is holding you back from a transforming moment in your life could it be that your attitude has been defeating your altitude you can't change the house and you can't change the kids and you can't change your situation but you can change your mind you can change your mind. When the prodigal son changed his mind, it changed his life. When the prodigal son changed his mind, it activated something in him at his darkest moment. And something in the darkness of his moment began to pull him back to the father's house. In the dark place. We'll call it the cocoon of transformation. Discovering something, getting more money, finding a solution doesn't bring about transformation. You have to get to the seed. But the seed cannot germinate in light. Listen, this is very important. The seed cannot germ germinate in the light. The only place a seed can be transformed is when you have the faith and courage to let it germinate in the dark place. The dark place of your life. The dark place is the cocoon of transformation. It's where everything comes to an end. It's where death becomes life. There's a place in every person's life. Some of you listening to me right now, I don't know who you are, but there's a place where everything grows very dark, just like when the caterpillar cocoons itself. It's where everything changes. It's a process. Do you know that in the process of transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly, do you know what the first thing that happens? The caterpillar attaches itself to a leaf or to a limb, and then it splits its own skin open and sheds its own skin. It sheds everything that has been around it. And then what was inside the skin, this most vulnerable place that is now exposed, begins to harden and crystallize. And everything inside that shell disintegrates. Literally. Even scientists to this day cannot fully explain how this happens. But it literally disintegrates the entire caterpillar liquefies inside of, the of, inside of the cocoon. Some of you here today are in the dark place. I'm not talking about financial struggles. I'm not talking about difficulties in your relationships. I'm not talking about your car or your house. I'm talking about the dark place of your soul. I'm talking about the part that nobody sees or feels but you and God. It's there in your mind, it's in your thoughts, it's in your emotion. Everything outside can even seem fine. You might be smiling on the outside and feel like you're dying on the inside. I want to tell you there's a deep place, there's a dark place that God always reserves to plant his seed. The potential of the seed is always released in the dark place of the cocoon. Maybe you've been praying for God to remove the dark place, but first God wants to use the dark place to germinate the seed. He wants to use the dark place to recreate the caterpillar. The dark place is the place that's beyond your ability to control. It's where your priorities change. It strips away the residue of your flesh. It's the thing that brings you to your knees till you have nowhere else to look 
but God. It's the place that brings you to humility so you will surrender to the place and the one that can bring out of you the potential that's inside of you. Because of the pain in that place, it causes you to listen where you wouldn't listen before. It causes you to hear what you wouldn't hear before. It humbles your arrogance and it disables you. That's where the seed germinates. That's what allows the transformation to occur. Listen, you endure the dark place, not because you don't have something, but because you do have something. You endure the dark place, not because everything is over, but because everything is about to begin. Listen, there's too much in you to leave you on the shelf, to leave you as an unfruitful seed. So God puts it into a place in your life where it can germinate. He brings you to the complete disintegration of self, the complete end of who you are and who you've been so God can transform you into who he's called you to be. Don't underestimate the value of the cocoon. can't develop out here where everybody can see. You can only develop inside in the cocoon. So God puts you in a cocoon of transformation. God places your seed in a dark hole and he covers it up with dirt, trusting that you're not going to die, but you're going to transform. In John 12, 24, Jesus says these words. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, a seed falls into the ground and dies it remains alone it's unfruitful but if it dies it will produce much grain Ooh, much fruit you might feel like you're going to die in your dark place and never come out, but it is the process that you are in where the enemy wants to destroy you, where you feel like I've come too far, I've sabotaged it, I've been disqualified, but it's in that place that God will plant the seed. It's in the dark place. No life forms outside of a womb. A womb is to a baby what the ground is to a seed. There's no light in the womb. The dark place is the place where everything with purpose emerges. That's why in creation God said the evening and the morning were the first day. Because God doesn't start with the light. He starts with the dark. Come on, that's prophetic for some of you today. Because you thought God had forsaken you. But God doesn't start with the light. He starts with the dark. That's why if you study Jewish history and you understand the Sabbath doesn't begin on Saturday morning, it begins on Friday evening, and it ends on Saturday evening because God said the evening and the morning were the first day because God never started anything in the light. He started it in the dark, and from the dark, he brings it to life. I don't know what that does for you, but for me, that encourages me. It lets me know that God has not forsaken me, that what the enemy would use to destroy me, God can shift it and change it. When I'm completely at the end of myself, when I'm completely disintegrated, I can then transform to become something that I never imagined I could become. It's powerful. It's the secret of transformation. It's the secret of Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Be transformed. Be transformed in the renewing of your mind. The dark place is where everything emerges. Woo, that's why Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You cry in the dark place so you can dance in the light. Come on. There's somebody here you don't think anybody knows how bad it is. But God is going to take that thing that wants to destroy you and he's going to use it to transform you. Mm. This apple, back to the apple. This apple, as good as it is, will never be its highest expression of itself in this form. For me, it might be very enjoyable, but for the apple, this isn't its highest form. The reason it won't be is because we can't see the purpose and potential 
inside the apple in the form it is. You don't see it, but there's a tree inside this apple. So you can't see it. All you see is fruit, and you think, hmm, I'd like to take a bite out of that. But inside of it, inside of the core, there's something, there's things in your life that you can't see because you're just observing something in the place that it is and not in the place that God has called it to emerge. You don't understand that inside of you is the potential for something so much bigger than you could ever see. But it will never reach the highest expression of itself if it's not transformed. If what's inside of it is not planted. You see? I, ha I have some peelings up here. I have some peelings. Some apple peelings right here, right? What would happen if I take these peelings and I bury them? And I put them in the ground? Will I get a tree out of it? But wait, it's part of the apple. It's still part of the apple. Is it, will I get, but I'm not going to get a tree. You know, I have some of the apple that was peeled, right? And you can take this and, man, you can cut a big piece of this apple flesh off. That's good. It's New York right there. I recognized the identity. I can take the flesh of this apple. Listen. Listen. And I can bury it. Is it going to make a tree? But it's the flesh. It's the flesh of the apple. The thing is, what I have to do is, I have to keep going deeper. I have to keep cutting in deeper. Until I get to something that's deep on the inside. I have to cut away all this flesh. I have to cut away all this stuff that's on the outside. Until I get to the core. Ooh, I see the core. How do I know I'm at the core? Because I can see the seed. I can see the seed. Some of you just haven't cut in deep enough yet to see what's really inside of you. Listen. Listen. Hmm. I have to go deeper. I'm at the core because I see the seeds. And what we want to do is get past all this fleshy stuff and get down to the core so we can find your seed. Because your future is in the seed which is beneath the flesh, in the core of who you are. None of this other stuff is as important as the seed. You can cut down to it. You can rot down to it. But until you get to the core, you're never going to fully see your purpose manifest. So here's my question. Do you have the courage to enter the cocoon? Will you go through the process of the dark place and not give up? And not quit? Back to the caterpillar. So inside of the caterpillar, God placed these cells... That really, science can't fully explain or understand. They call them imaginal cells. And in the imaginal cells is the potential to become something completely different than what it was before. Not a different version, but actually a complete metamorphosis. A complete change. These cells contain the capacity to transform the caterpillar into the butterfly it was designed to be. The caterpillar transforms completely, leaving behind what it was and becoming something new. All the potential was already inside of the seed, but it has to strip off everything and go into the cocoon for a season of time so that it can become something new new and when it emerges it will begin to break out of the cocoon and if you see a butterfly coming out of the cocoon don't help it out of the cocoon because it'll die because it's the pressure of breaking out of the cocoon that causes the the blood and the fluid to fill up the wings and strengthen its wings 
so it can fly. You see, God designed you to fly, but it begins by understanding who he called you to be. This is so important. Just about done. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. You don't even have to turn there, but I want you to get a hold of this because this is important. When we're talking into your transformation, when we're speaking into who God has called you to be, when we're speaking into who God has called us to be as a church, there's been every single service has been different in these meetings. Every single service has been speaking into something. There's been a disintegrating and a reforming of something. And I believe out of this series of meetings, we're getting ready to explode as a body of believers like we've never exploded before because we have to be a light to a generation that is quickly spiraling out of control. And if we can't be the voice and the light for it in here, there's no hope if the church can't be it because this is the mechanism that God called to be a light. But we have to be transformed. Everything's been transforming us. Ephesians 1.18, quickly, it says this. The eyes of your understanding. Your what? Your understanding. Your, your eyes of your understanding, your thinking. The eyes of your thinking needs to be enlightened. Guess what that means? That means it's been in a dark place. You don't have to enlighten something that has been enlightened. You enlighten something that's been dark, right? The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's your imaginal selves. That's your potential. That's what God has put inside of you. But you have to let God come and turn on the cells inside of you, the potential inside of you, the calling that he placed inside of you. God is saying that he's going to shed light on the way you understand your situation so you can know his calling. He's going to shed light on the things that you don't fully comprehend so that you can know his purpose. He's going to shed light on your thinking so you can capture his riches. He's going to shed light on you so you can experience his glory. Mm. In other words, God wants you to know what he hoped when he planted you. The hope of his calling. God wants you you think about hoping in what God has for you, but God also has hope in what you have for Him. Hope that He planted in you. God is saying He wants you to fulfill something, but for you to fulfill it, your understanding has to be brought to light. Your understanding has to be transformed. Your understanding has to be changed. You have to see that where you are is an incubator. Where you are is not your destination. Where you are is your transportation. God is taking you somewhere. He's taking you. There is divine instinct placed by God on the inside of you that is leading you somewhere. But how do you ingest, digest, and develop? This one, oh, there it is. Woo. How do I ingest, digest, and develop what God has appropriated inside of me? Cognition. Everybody say cognition. Say recognition. If you put that together, it's recognition. You have to recognize by the enlightenment of your understanding, you have to recognize that God is not finished with you. You have to recognize that where you're at is not your end point. You have to recognize that where you're at is not your final place. Where you're at is something new. Something you haven't seen before. Ooh, it's divine instinct. I'm talking about 
your cognitive skills in the enlightenment of God's eternal calling and purpose. As you are learning what you need to be learning about your life and purpose, God begins to work something in you. Are you able to see something you haven't seen before or are you disabled in your capacity to recognize where you are and what's going on inside because you're too captured by your circumstances that you can't have faith that God is working in the dark place. That he's breaking open the seed. That he's reforming what's in the cocoon. That there's something ahead. That what is right now, what Paul called this light struggle, is working for me a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. There is something inside of me that is so glorious. It's better than a caterpillar to a butterfly. Come on, it's better than a worm to a butterfly. It's something so much greater than what we could ever imagine. And God brings you back to himself. I want to use this one illustration as we close. And I was studying, I was talking to Pam. We were on, on vacation. We were on vacation. We had an opportunity. We actually took a little detour through one of those little butterfly houses. They had all these butterflies and all these interesting facts about butterflies. And we were just going to kind of look through because we wanted to see inside. But what you saw was there's a very fascinating thing that happens in that transformation from those imaginal cells inside the butterfly. Because especially if you've ever studied the cycle or the migration of a monarch butterfly. This butterfly is born in Canada. And the butterfly, not a jet plane, the butterfly migrates 3,000 miles all the way down to Mexico. It finds a tree. And it finds this tree, and at this tree it begins to mate. And after it mates, the male dies. The female goes and begins a slow process back towards Canada and, and lays eggs. And then the female dies, and then the eggs create new cocoons, which create new butterflies. And then they continue on farther back towards Canada. And then as they lay eggs, they die. And then their seed to the third generation, three to four generations of butterflies before it makes it back to Canada. Now listen. The fourth generation in Canada will turn around and migrate back 3,000 miles to Mexico, not just to the same forest that it came from, but to the specific tree. Nobody in science can explain why this happens. It wasn't even the original butterfly. It was three generations, four generations later that comes back to the exact tree 3,000 miles away. This is absolutely profound. What I want you to see today, just like the prodigal son, God put something inside of you that no matter how far you get away, no matter what your mama did, no matter what your grandpa did, no matter what's been lost in the process, no matter where you've been shorted, there's something inside of you. If you will let God get a hold of it, my God, he did this in a butterfly so that we could understand something. If we will let God get a hold of us, he will bring us back to the place he originally created for us to be. Woo! He's going to bring you back to the place he designed you for. Hmm. He's going to bring you back. My God, this blows my mind. How can God do it? But what God is saying, you can look, you can blame the government, you can blame mom and dad, you can blame whoever you want to blame, but if you'll quit blaming and get on the inside of you, God said there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. There is nothing that can stop the purposes of God from working in you. If you will allow him to transform you, it does not matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done.
my God, God's taking you somewhere. Woo, stand up to your feet right now. Come on, Jesus. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, if you'll move that out of the way. God is doing something and he's saying something to you. It was the most profound thing. I was trying to find a way to write that down. I hit that hit me last night and I was trying to get away from everybody to write it down because I didn't want to forget because God was saying something. And he's saying something for us today. He's saying something in this conference, my God. If we could get a hold of what God has prepared for us, the exceeding greatness toward us that believe. Mm, my God, he's got something so much bigger than what we could ask or even think according to the power that works in us, the power that is the seed. There's just verse after verse. There's, there, there's scripture after scripture that points to the core. It points to the seed today. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but whoever is here and you've been in the dark place of your soul, I'm not talking about what's going on on the outside. We all have struggles on the outside. I'm talking about the place on the inside where you feel like you're holding on by a thread. You feel like you're barely hanging on. My God, I want to just give up sometimes because I'm in the season of the cocoon. I feel like everything is disintegrating inside of me. You're smiling on the outside, but you feel like you're dying on the inside. Who am I talking to today? God wants to strengthen you. He wants to begin to work in the imaginal cells on the inside of you today. Mm. Right now, God is speaking from His realm 3,000 miles away to where you are, maybe where you feel like you are, so far away from where you're created to be. So far away. But there's something inside of you prodigal son there's something that can't disconnect from the father's house Whew. so much to say if I'm talking to you right now I want to pray for you right now if that's you I know this is hard to answer because it really is a very vulnerable and sensitive place in our lives when we really come to grips with where we are inside. But if you will do it, God is going to do it. I want you to come down. If that's you, I want you to just slip out of your seat. Some are already coming. I want you to come down here. If I'm talking to you, you felt almost like you're about to give up. You feel like you're 3,000 miles away. You feel like I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm, I, I know where I can still see it, but I feel like I'm so distant from it, God. Am I ever going to see what you promised? Am I ever going to get to the place where you've told me to get to? My God. Come on, God is speaking to somebody here today. God is speaking to somebody here today. In Transform Stronger 2017, He's going to take the very darkness on the inside of you and He's going to awaken it. Don't give up in the dark place. It might not be over tomorrow, but God is still working something. You might still be pushing through it in another month, but God is still working something. You just stay put until you emerge until it's time for you to break out and be who God has called you to be. He's pulling you back. My God, He's pulling you back. I feel it in the Spirit. He's pulling you back to His house right now. Lift your hands high if you're up here. If you're up front right now, just lift your hands high. If you're at your seats, do me a favor. Just stretch your hands up here. Because if you're not there, you have been there or you will be there. Amen? Right now, I want you to say, Lord, I take my hands off the control. Transform me in my thinking. Set my mind on your purpose. Come on, tell God, I give you my urges, whatever it is that tempts you to give up, whatever it is that tempts you 
to suffocate your pain in some other issue or way. Come on. If you'll just give it to God, you're going to be free right now. You're going to be free right now. Right in this moment. Before hands are even laid on you, you're going to be free right now in this moment. My God, something is happening. Something is happening. Tell him, God, I give it to you. I take my hands off. Take my life. Come on, take my life. I see it. The purposes of God are being They're being released. They're being reformed. Oh my God. My God. My God. My God. Come on, don't quit. Press in. Meet God in the dark place. Meet God in the dark place. Meet God in the dark place right now. Come on, he's transforming you. Some of you are in the cocoon. Some of you are breaking out. Unless the seed falls into the ground and dies, it can't bring forth fruit. Come on, my God, something is happening. My God. Hallelujah. Will Gallerani, don't despise the day of small beginnings. The hand of God is reaching from you. You didn't ask to go there. God asked you. You answered. God is responding. But unless the seed falls into the ground and dies, it can't bring forth fruit. I see a revival coming in that region. I see revival hitting that region. I've been seeing it yesterday and today. It's like I see a vision of people coming from all over, from two, three, four hours away way coming and getting healed and getting changed and miracles happening i see it in an unusual place come on don't despise the day of small beginnings come on worship team Jesus. you have been so so kind Still your love fall for me. Come on, it's fighting for you. Come on. You have been so so good to me. Yes, you have. When I fell no worth, you paid it all for me. been so, so kind to me.
don't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up coming after me Today. Lives are being changed today.